Hi there. Thank you for downloading and listening to the Lean Into Art Cast, a show where a couple of visual story- storytellers get together to take on various topics that tend to occur to one when you go off to do this thing we call communicating with images. We think hard about this stuff, so you will too. My name is Jersey Drozd. I am a cartoonist and teaching artist, and the other host is... Hey, Jersey. I'm Rob Stenzinger. I am a UX coach and interactive storyteller of sorts. <laughs> Oh, st- starting to massage the uh, the the job description a little bit, right? Every week, can't pin <laughs> me down. <laughs> we were talking about this a couple episodes ago. This whole idea, no, maybe it was on extra lean. We were talking about like this whole idea of um, being an inconsistent human being and like trying to like, well, don't lock me to like one sentence summaries of who I am. You don't know me. Yeah. <laughs> you don't know- <laughs> Exactly. You don't know me. Hi, I'm Jersey Dros. You don't know me. <laughs> Whatever. Try to <laughs> label this podcaster. Um, it, yeah, it's it's an interesting thing with the whole idea of labels and and you know careers and career paths and all this kind of stuff. Uh, how do you describe the service that which, which you provide? And do you define yourself entirely by that service and stuff too? Where, yeah. Uh, I am a lot of things. <laughs> and also, yeah, in the, in the, in the, to, to be um, helpful in this conversation, getting, giving some kind of context. I do like how we, we do an intro and, and it's like, this is what we're about to embark on. Um, hopefully you've downloaded this on purpose and you're curious to, to delve in more. And just along the way, that, that little label is, is always a thing I'm, I guess I, I keep thinking about. Like what's mm. the most relevant thing to say right now right now Mm -hmm. and uh i give it a try (laughs) and so yeah so i i I just i i underlined it because i think that part of doing this project is also modeling behaviors right and you know like there's there's lots of different opinions on this kind of stuff i just met with a young artist the other day uh and they were you know asking me about best practices and i'm like well i can't tell you best practices but i can tell you my practices and why i do what i do and we got on the topic of business cards and i went on my little jag about how it's like i don't carry business cards i carry mini comics because a business card tells me almost nothing about you as a cartoonist it says oh they they draw really nice but i don't know what their storytelling is like i don't know what kind of stories they like to do you know Uh, you can write out those things like youth comics illustrator well that tells me something but like if if i've got an eight page mini comic with your contact information in it now i've got something that i can say like oh i know what project this person would be right for you know um so i feel like that's the kind of conversation that we're modeling every week when we do this show lean into art it's like here's here's and everything we do is potentially teachable moments and modeling activity so there we go i unpacked it that's (laughs) <laughs> that's you even brought in mini comics which is which is the topic uh today that that's very convenient so <laughs> what is what is our angle on on mini comics today that we that we teased last week in the rebroadcast intro that's right that's right last week we rebroadcasted episode 215 which was an exploration of the advantages and the affordances and the and just celebrating mini comics in general why we love them as a medium as a format whatever you want to call them and this week, I thought what might be fun um, would be to walk through. So when we were doing Art Sound Off last month, Art Sound Off being this this uh, yearly challenge we do where we, you and I foolishly decide to check in every day over the month of November with an audio journal <laughs> about our art, and we ask everybody else to play along. Um, and we came up with a list of prompts, which you interacted with a little bit over the course of the month. I didn't use the prompts at all, but... Somebody who was participating in the challenge in one of their art sound off entries said, you know, it's like, yeah, Jersey and Rob don't necessarily like to follow rules a whole lot, <laughs> but, uh, but I, yeah, I know like, like, like we're like the Fonz, right? <laughs> <laughs> sure. I would counter that by saying we just have our own internal principles <laughs> that we use as our guide most of the time. But rules could be fun, too, to play along. And and he was just highlighting how, like, having the prompts was helpful to him, having some place to start. And I thought about another moment at A2CAF a couple years ago where we were doing some of the Incubate pre-conference stuff. We were making comics, and a friend was sitting next to me, and we were trying to make a mini-comic from scratch. And I saw them, like, really just staring at the abyss of the blank page. And I leaned over and just whispered, I'm like, just throw some lines down. Throw some lines down and watch what happens. And they started, and then they, start, they got momentum, you know? And so... 
while I'll speak only for myself on this, Rob, I tend to get itchy when somebody puts a framework of uh, guide guidelines and rules in front of me with a creative challenge, and I look for ways to hack and explore and, and push beyond those, those rules. Um, I do acknowledge that they can be profoundly useful when starting something from scratch. So celebrate mini comics. Mini comics are wonderful. Well, so I should probably make some mini comics then. Sure, I would recommend it. I would actually encourage it. Well, what do I make a mini comic about? You know, um, test some hypotheses. What hypotheses? Okay, well, let's look at some workshops that Anne and I have been leading uh, while on book tour for Science Comics Rockets to prompt people in a very short time span to get started on an idea. So we've got two different workshops that we're going to walk through um, on how, like, if you're the person who's sitting there going, like, I don't know what to even begin to write about. Well, here's some strategies that we've developed. And then in the second half, what I've got lined up for us is even if you do have an idea, here's a structure that I actually use on almost all my mini comics as a way to get me to start hanging ideas on hooks so that I can start to string them together into something that's cohesive. Does that sound like fun? Does it sound like at least not a bad time? <laughs> <laughs> well, it sounds like my kind of fun. <laughs> and uh, that, what else can I ask for? It's it the uh, I, I don't know a couple things to, to dots to, to to point at things that you mm-hmm. shared. I think this whole um, like we started this whole podcast modeling the activity that uh, we believe in both the um, like there's a development process that we can all benefit from by engaging in the uh, teaching and sharing what you learn side of things and also being on the learning side of things. And Mm -hmm. we have a variety of, I think, not just stuff we made up about all this, but we sort of channel in stuff that we've learned and how we care about teaching and, and that worked in, you know, things like, uh, facilitating experiences and, and meeting people at different skill levels and how do they navigate, uh, benefiting from this kind of thing? How do you relate to it and all that stuff? And we, we talk about this as, uh, people who feel a sense of agency when we engage with a problem. And I do have a huge bias toward encouraging others to, to feel that as well, but at the same time, except not everyone feels that and you can be Mm -hmm. stuck. You can be um, at a, for a variety of reasons, not quite feeling the, like you have a grasp on how to proceed with a thing, even if if the thing seems appealing and worthwhile and, so, and which, which we, um, which is why we, I mean, everything we do here is like the podcast has kind of a framework, the, um, the overall, I mean, there's just, there's a lot of things that you, that you can do to, to sort of get some kind of direction from, um, intentionally going about solving a problem, like making a creative effort, right? Like a mini comic and, like all that stuff is just constantly weaving in and out of the show. I guess I don't know. That's yeah. No, uh, thank so you. So it makes sense. The the impression that we we don't care about rules. Eh, it's just <laughs> a more flexible relationship with rules. So like there I'm hugely into rigor, right, and intentionality. Yeah. But through mm-hmm. rigor and intentionality, I like you can you can say like, hey, let's make a song, Jersey. Yeah. What kind yeah, of song okay. you want to make? <laughs> right. Right. What instruments yeah, it, are invited? What you know. The and we both no constraints is a tr- evil trap in and of itself. That's very true. And we've talked on the show a lot about how limitations breed creativity, right? Like mm-hmm. a lot of my projects are me intentionally hemming myself in so that I have to sort of find a creative way out of this creative problem I've created. Creative problem I've created. There we go. Uh, <laughs> it's nested. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it's it's not an, an, an abandonment of rules, but it's more like a, a flexibility and, and a playfulness with the kinds of rules you choose to abide by for the parameters of the project. All projects have to have parameters, right? Um, and it's okay to have different levels of comfort, comfort with different amounts of rules or, yep. uh, you know, context and uh, constraints to yep. engage with your creative activity. Uh, and and I think what, we, what you have here, you prepared a uh, you facilitate, I really enjoy the kind of learning experiences you, you share. I've seen you, you know, I've, I've been in your classes and I've, I've observed your classes and how you, how you teach and whatnot. And so I, th- I think everyone's in for a treat with these two different approaches to tackle, uh, well, fiction and nonfiction mini comics that in the, on their own, like are sort of, 
in a way like mini mini workshops or lessons that you can uh, you can engage with, you know, and and follow um, enough structure to help you succeed without um, you know having to face too many too much ambiguity. But then it's not overly structured either, right? There's so much it doesn't tell you what you know. You're not yeah. Saying, like yeah, a nonfiction mini comic about the Pikachu pen that you bought at you know Walgreens. Make make that a nonfiction mini comic that teaches me how to build a clock from scratch. Right? Yeah, <laughs> nothing like that. No, and yeah, and we get into the caveats as we dive into it. I feel like we're diving into it, so I'm just going to hit the music. And uh, you know, since we're talking about nonfiction, I'll pull a little piece of history. You know, we're still celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Apollo missions for at least another couple of weeks. So, all right. Uh, so, nonfiction mini comics. Uh, this is a workshop that Ann and I like really did a lot uh, during the the Rockets book tour. And what it what it um, what it is is it's it's designed to be something that gets you to talk about a subject that you are comfortable discussing. Right, because I, I think part of the the first hurdle to starting a, a new project from scratch is deciding what to talk about. And my personal preference is if I am dealing with ambig ambiguity in terms of tools, in terms of playing with skills that I'm not terribly comfortable with yet, let me at least pick subject matter that I um, am very comfortable with. Right. So, in other words, like this this goes back to my high school experience. I remember when I was learning oil painting in high school, and you know oil paints are not like super intuitive and easy. And, um, you know, it takes a lifetime to really master them. And I'm 15 and I'm doing it for the first time. Right. And so I thought, well, at least if I'm going to do this, because this wasn't something I really signed on for is in terms of like, I didn't think I was gonna be doing this the rest of my life. This is just something I'm doing in art class. It's an assignment. It's assigned to me by somebody else. <laughs> you know, there's a lack of agency here. So I decided I'm going to paint uh, a Spider-Man villain. So I'm 15. I love Spider-Man a lot. And so I, I chose Carrion, the Spider-Man villain who was like the main villain in Spectacular Spider-Man that year. And I started painting him. And my teacher's like, oh, I really wish you'd paint something real. And I'm like, well, lady, you're just pushing me farther away from this. Because <laughs> like now you're asking me to do something like I don't I, I didn't have a lot of practice drawing from life yet because I was still a kid practicing to draw comics. So at least give, so anyway, that's my bias going into this. Like, okay, if I'm going to ask you to do something that maybe you're not terribly comfortable with, constructing a story from scratch on a little tiny canvas, pick something that is um, familiar to you that you, that I can ask you about, and you can just burn my ears off talking about this subject. Right? You either know a lot about it or you have a lot of passion for it. Um, so then, like the rest of the parts, will you know the 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 rest of your bandwidth can be um, assigned to the monumental task of creating an eight page mini comic. Um, so I have a uh, link that I will share in the show notes, but I'll pull it up on the screen. There are lots of, if you do a lot of searching online, you'll find this over and over again. It's, it's uh, an eight page mini comic zine that you create from a single sheet of paper and a pair of scissors. And it's just like three folds on a sheet of paper. And I'm scrolling through it on the screen and then and I'll, I'll hold it up and show you the finished result in a second. But you fold it three times and then like you make one cut and then you fold it back up again and then you've got a little mini booklet. So what it looks like is this. So here's the single sheet of letter-sized copy paper folded one, two, three times. And then you open it back up to, you know, hamburger style fold, you make one cut on the side that has the fold and then turn it landscape mode whoops I'm sure I get it in the shot right and um and then you get this diamond in the middle and you you know gather it and now you've got a little eight page booklet and you've got cover page one two page two three four five wait a minute did i do that right cover no nope, you counted two twice i did one two three four five, six, and the back cover is page seven. So it's eight pages in total with the cover. Um, and then what I do is, so we, we, we make, first you make your template, and you can see that this isn't an enormous canvas, right? Um, so do I have a copy of another comic book here? Ah, I just so happen to have, man, this looks like I'm really like shilling myself. Tell your parents, kids, this Christmas, um, a copy of the Warren Commission Report 
graphic uh, comics documentary that I did uh, with Dan Mishkin and Ernie Clone for Abrams Comic Arts. So here's like a traditional graphic novel size. Here's the size of that mini comic template that you just made, right? It's not even a quarter the size of a page. It's really tiny. What I like about it, about doing it this small, is one, it means that at the end of the of the day, you'll have something that you can photocopy and make copies of if you enjoyed what you made. But it, it's like you don't have space to worry about making great drawings, right? <laughs> Unless you are like some kind of like, you know, supervision genius who can draw super tiny. And there are artists who are like that. Most of us aren't going to be able to do like lavish illustrations on a canvas this size, right? So focusing yeah, on storytelling. So I, I guess you can embrace that as part of the challenge, but that's not necessarily the point. It's instead of fighting the constraint harder, uh, just sort of go with it. Go with it and, and accept the fact that you're really just focusing on storytelling right now. You're not focusing on illustration. Again, trying to take away some of these these overhead pressures of like writing something of great genius and drawing something of great genius. Let's just engage with storytelling for a minute. So then we take five minutes. So you just set, the, set all the drawing tools down, just take a pen and a piece of scratch paper and you get five minutes to brainstorm as many topics as you can that follow the following two criteria, either one or both. So either a topic you're passionate about. So um, Lord of the Rings is the best book series of all time. Um, Squirtle is the greatest Pokemon. Um, mayonnaise is better than mustard. <laughs> you know, whatever topic you you come up with, and, and, and it might even be fun if you could do an either or. Like this is better than that. Um, the Detroit Tigers are better than the New York Mets. What, whatever topic you want, but it should be something that you have a lot of drive about. Like if I ask you about it, I will be sorry because you will never stop talking to me about it, that kind of topic. Um, or a topic of something you can teach, something you know how to do, and you know how to do it well enough that you can break down the procedure to explain it to somebody else. How to how to stream live on Twitch, how to, you know, uh, make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, how to tie a shoe, how to how to fold uh, fitted sheets <laughs> on a bed. That's a good one. I'd love to learn how to do that better. Um, so either something you know how to do or something that you're really passionate about or both. And then you just like take, set a timer for five minutes and just brainstorm as many of them as you can. So you're filling up a page with ideas, hopefully. And then upon finishing that, you take it, you set the timer again for five minutes. You're going to pick one of those. You're going to look through the whole list you have and you're going to say, which one of these feels like it's got the most, it feels the most interesting to me right now. The most interesting, I'm not saying it's the best idea. I'm saying whichever one you feel like, okay, I could talk about that right now. Um, doesn't have to be your favorite one. Just the one that you feel like you have the most um, energy to expand upon. And then setting the timer for five minutes, you're going to write down five list items. You're going to make five bullet points. And so we're not writing full sentences here, just an idea for each bullet point. Five things, either five reasons that this thing is so great, five reasons mayonnaise is better than mustard, um, or if you're teaching a, a subject, like how to stream live on Twitch, how to tie a shoe, what are the five steps? What are, what are five steps that you need to know in order to do this thing well? So five steps or five reasons with five minutes on the clock. So with me so far? <laughs> yeah, I'm with you. What, um, um, so we, as, you're, as you're going through this, I, I, I'm, I'm hearing like 10 minutes so far, but maybe there's a little bit of space in between. Right. So because it's like you you did your brainstorm, but then there's but now there's the OK, you got affected by your brainstorm. There's something that's standing out. There's some kind of breathing room where in between, mm -hmm. right, where someone can the, you, you've made that choice. And then you're into this next gauntlet of, all right, dig deeper, dig into it. Uh, yep. I'm tracking. Okay. Yep. Cool. So, yeah, you might want to put in there if you're doing this at home. It's like after you do your five minute brainstorm, maybe pour yourself a cup of tea, pour yourself a cup of coffee. Thoughtfully drink it for a second, sip your drink, look at your 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 messy brainstorm and see which idea stands out. Mm. Then pick that idea, set the timer for five minutes again, and then dive into um, this this list making. So after done after doing that, after writing out your five things, now let's look at our template again. Um, remember cover. One, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. So this is going to be your cover. And then page one is your introduction. 
So your narrator character is going to show up and say, hi, today I'm going to teach you about why mayonnaise is better than mustard, right? Page two is step or list item one. Page three, so like for instance, mayonnaise uh, g- works on a, a wider variety of bread types. I mean, that's one of the, one of the, uh, the, the list items that you had. Uh, two, mayonnaise is made of... Let me tell bread and non-porous <laughs> bread. There we go, yeah. Uh, bread and density. If you, and if you're really adventurous, even crackers. Um, two, mayonnaise is made of eggs and can be used on eggs, you know, like that kind of idea. So anyway, so page three is, is list item two. Page four is list item three. Page five is list item uh, four. Page six is list item five. And page seven is conclusion. Congratulations. Now you know why mayonnaise is better than mustard, right? Um, so, and... And I'll, I will very quickly, for those who haven't made these these templates before, I'm going to go ahead and write out. And I have I have a, a template that you can download. Um, it's like a, a TIFF file that you can just download and print out if you want to use it to fold and keep track of these numbers. But um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to write out the numbers to each of these pages. And I'll show you a neat trick at the end. This is why I like doing this one. Page 7. Okay, so once again... Is it washed out? There we go. We got the cover one and two and so on. Mm-hmm. When you unfold the paper, all of the art is on one side. So, right? So it is trivial to then make photocopies of your mini comic, which you can now take to comic conventions and trade with other cartoonists. And now you have a working business card to share with people. Um, should you decide to, you know, if you decide that it's of sufficient quality or if you feel comfortable enough sharing it with the world. But that's another aspect of this that I really like is like it it gives you a scaffolding or a quick on-ramp to making something that you feel that you have a lot of uh, interest and passion about. It gets you engaged with making comics. And if you feel really good at the end, you can like ramp up that excitement by making um, making a product out of it if you want to. But you don't have to. I mean, the experience itself is what matters. That's impressive. I, I mean, you've you've done a, a heck of a sales pitch. Where um, I tend to, when I when I've done mini comics, I I don't quite go to the extreme like like we've shared on other episodes. Like, there's inspiring, super clever. Um, I mean, as a medium, it, mini comics is actually a, a very flexible thing. Where it's, it's like you can. Um, you could do folding and stapling, you could do stitching, you could do lots of other things, but you don't have to. You can do this, that single page, one-sided template. It's amazing how approachable that makes it. And mm-hmm. uh, I think what I need to do is, is, is accept, that, <laughs> accept that as a wonderful constraint. Uh, because so far on many comics projects, I, I tend to say, well, let's make it about as hard as a regular comic, just smaller. <laughs> yeah yeah and i mean this is something that i i have certainly wrestled with the same idea and i've tried to use in the past used inktober as an opportunity to hack that and get approach as the difficulty level of as hard as a full-size comic but smaller but like use the constraint of but it's only an hour a day that's all you get you only get an hour a day to work on this as an opportunity to remind myself walk away from it You know, don't, you know, don't break your back on this stuff. It's supposed to be fun, you know? So like that, uh, the one year, uh, what was it? Like three years ago, I did uh, the Boulder and Fleet mini comic, um, A Friendly Game, which was a 24 page mini comic um, Mm -hmm. where I was inking a page a day, an hour at a time. So I was really rushing through the art um, and I still feel like it's a pretty okay looking book but I, I also means that i have like a really expensive product now because now it's a 24 page mini comic it's harder to collate it's harder to like print the cover and like make all the you know i wind up having to cut it to like get the so the pages aren't sticking out of the cover so with, when i did the bear Mom bear one last year i was like yeah let's just go back to doing like an eight page story <laughs> because <laughs> You know, it's like I, I love that Boulder and Fleet story, but I feel like some of the joy got uh, corrupted by the leading in hard and trying to like ship something really great. So um, that's interesting. And so, like the industriousness, the ambition, uh, 
the your your creative voice and all that stuff. There's so many. There's some. There's a lot of good intentions in the complicated, challenging uh, mini comics. The mm-hmm. yet, and, and they still have aspects where that you can, you know, maybe there is there is a little more efficiency as far as time and investment and whatnot. Uh, where the hurdle isn't as high as a typical. Um, sort of like full i don't what would you say is is a what's a what's a non mini comic um, yeah not, a non like a, a non mini a non mini comic would be something in my case it would be um well, how would i define it 600 dpi uh larger than um larger than digest size which is like a eight and a half by 11 letter size page fold in half so lar- l- larger canvas than that um and it could be black and white or color, but it would be of sufficient production value that you wouldn't hesitate to charge somebody if they wanted you to draw that, right? I mean, I wouldn't hesitate for, to charge somebody to draw a mini comic for them either, but I'm saying that like, um, there's a level of uh, production value that I feel like is called for when somebody offers to pay you a page rate. Um, it's isn't it interesting trying to define it because it is like you, you can have like a really well executed mini comic and then we're talking there's a bit of a broad brush not to overcomplicate the topic but like you've got maybe there's the the casual aspect of it, it maybe that's a dimension it's so if you have a casual mini comic with um maybe high quality um let's see okay some distinction so it's lower resolution maybe lower density lower Mm -hmm. um lower density and lower intensity (laughs) and then you have the mini comics that are more intense where it's it's Mm -hmm. the the mini comic artifact art piece things where you went for that uh it's it's small and fancy i i think i think there's an element too of improvisation or sort of urgent writing that traditionally I don't do for my professional work with my professional work. There's a level of, I'm going to write an outline and I'm going to show it to you. We're going to talk about that outline and then you're going to give me notes and then I'm going to do a round of thumbnails. I'm going to show you those thumbnails and you're going to give me notes and I'm going to refine those again when I go to final copy. And then you're going to look at final copy. You're going to get one more round of changes at that point, right? There's, there's a back and forth and a refining of the product that happens when it's professional grade versus when it's a mini comic. It's like, I give myself permission to, invent on the fly Mm. less stages less process Mm -hmm. yep Um, because something of those qualities are are, um i think invisible when we talk about this just the size of the the mini comic so that so when you you invite them to your constraints then i think that i think it sets you up to succeed and 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 something that I actually, I really do want to try Um, because I mean, I've dabbled a little bit and just sort of sitting around with my kids doing mini comic type things, but uh, I've, I've never taken, it's almost like I I made it too casual where it just was about playfully filling some pages, no Mm. real narrative, nothing. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, And anyway, so somewhere in between there is like, well, you've got some intentional narrative and this, this is meant there, there is a utility to this, but it's but it's not so not so serious. It's more flexible, less process, less stages. Um, anyway. Yeah, it's it's it goes back to something that Brandon Dayton said on the show about where your sketchbook is the place where you should fail, and I feel like a mini comic is a place where you should feel comfortable with failing. Um, but when this kind of mini comic exercise, and what I mean by that is, is that there's that twelve twelve project that Ann and I did like 10, 11 years ago, where we would sit down with a bag of just little tchotchkes just grabbed from all over our condo you were you visited my old place and you saw how many little like action figures and trinkets and weirdness was all over the walls so we just like randomly grab a bunch of things put in a bag and we'd grab um a bunch of new york times headlines just the headlines and we would like you have to pull two headlines and three objects and you'd have to write a six panel story based on those that random assortment of materials and try to really write something, try to actually create something with a narrative structure to it. And we only gave ourselves a couple hours to do it. And 
there were times where I felt like I didn't really make anything. <laughs> like I, you could see where I was trying, and there was the ones where I was like, "Oh, Jersey was trying to be clever, and he failed." You know, it's like, what's the lesson there? Well, don't get too hung up on being clever. If you just would have gone for the obvious idea, you would have had a finished thing that had a, a narrative thrust to it. And then other times, I discovered, you know, it's like. Um, in exploring genres and styles and uh, subject matter that I wouldn't normally do. Like, for instance, like Ukrainian leader gets poisoned. Well, how do I build something out of that? You know, um, I wound up writing things that were in genres or uh, tones that are not typical for me. And so then the narrative arc would be there, but it was like, ooh, that went dark. You know, I remember there was one story I did where it was um, two astronauts on the moon and one of the guys is in the um, the lunar module, and he's slowly losing his mind and won't let the other guy in. And so the other guy's oxygen is is, is slowly draining. He, he can't radio for home. The other guy's going, and in, in, you know he's becoming a lunatic inside of the lunar module. And it just ends that way. It ends with him looking up at the Earth, going like, oh, "I wonder what's going to happen," you know. And I was like, that felt like a haunting ending for something that I outside of my character. <laughs> so was that a failure? Right? Did I fail? Or did I experiment and play with my art, you know? Yeah, I guess that depends. Obviously, you can you could bring either either perspective to that. Um, from from it sounds. Let's see, that is a. Uh, I remember you shared that exercise on on some podcasts in the past, and that is, mm -hmm. that is a pretty pretty interesting one. And I think the sincerely adopting the constraints is an element of what you're you're sharing here mm -hmm. and the size is part of it the um the being purposeful and having some kind of narrative is part, part of it right so because i think in the absence of that you know if you just throw like um just eight drawings that, that's not necessarily um accomplishing this a narrative could be found, but you're asking a lot of the reader. I guess that's another bias that I'm bringing to this is that my perspective on making comics is um, a primary objective is to achieve clarity. And so clarity has nothing to do or has little to do with uh, representational image rendering. Clarity has to do with using shape, size, line, and color to communicate meaning. So got to think about what meaning you're trying to communicate and how do you use these shapes, size, lines, and colors to, to achieve that. Um, so that's, that's, that's why I always kind of lean on this idea of like, you don't have to do great illustrations as long as you're thinking thoughtfully about design principles and thinking about what you're actually trying to say. And I think that's, that's what sort of my line of uh, inquisition here is, is about like unearthing a couple of principles that, that mm -hmm. I think are, um, contained within this that I th that that they sound pretty great like I'm, I'm looking to basically I'm looking to steal some principles honestly <laughs> we, bo we, <laughs> we, we both have a, a proclivity for looking for principles right principles are great at, at, at uh, diffusing ambiguity um, yeah and then yep. and then the whole idea of asking you for a subject that you either know a lot about or are very passionate about helps connect you with meaning faster now I know what I'm trying to say I know what I mean Therefore, now let's apply these design principles to help me communicate that meaning that I feel so strongly, right? It's meant to connect you really quickly with engaging with this idea rather than getting stuck in all of the um, bewildering array of choices when it comes to like, what well, am I gonna talk about this? I'm gonna talk about that. I'm gonna talk about my childhood. I'm gonna talk about like, you know, uh, quantum physics. Uh, what am I actually gonna talk about here, right? So- um, Every day I ask this. <laughs> that's that's the the binary decision facing rob every morning mm -hmm. uh so okay that said so what are some like to further model this before we move on to the second half um what are some things that you that come to mind as oh i could make a nonfiction mini comic about these subjects uh i think some pretty straightforward ones are things on my short list that i either have already taught lessons on or are coming up that I intend to create some some digital workshops surrounding. So things like uh, using doodle characters, um, especially the the one that I call the H ball, and the uh, it's like a, it's a it's a very flexible kind of creation where I'm, I'm just going to do something on paper and and then put this in front of the camera, where you have the character who the bottom of their body is the letter H right? Mm -hmm. Capital letter H. And then you can add arms to it right at the neck level and throw a, a ball head on top. The head can have different proportions and sizes. The um, 
but then the the those lines um can do so many things especially when you are um let's see so i just did another you know h yeah. same amount of lines basically but now that person has a lot more dynamic pose uh something mm -hmm. wrong with their um eye but still <laughs> um <clears throat> the uh so that that is a very it's very expressive it's very human it brings people into the picture i'm a huge fan of it i use this when i facilitate workshops and i can put pe lots of people doing interesting things really fast uh into a conversation so i i'm a big fan so so you would do like a, a mini comic explaining this concept of using this character in facilitating meetings mm. and so chunk chunk yeah. five five reasons or five ways that it gets used and then you know, front end it and back end it with an intro, outro, and a cover. Mm -hmm. and then you Very make doable. Page like, yeah, yeah, I, I, I think that's. I, I honestly don't see why not. Um, it's almost like why not do this kind of thing for your other endeavors? Where this, like this, this is. Uh, it's very approachable. Like literally the, this can be done in, in less than an hour. I'm like, how long is this workshop typically when you typically the, the, we do this workshop in an hour and a half. Okay. So very doable to put something together in that time frame. And now you have this ar artifact. Maybe it's a success. Maybe it's not, but like that artifact, I mean, it probably could be iterated on. Not absolutely. To, uh, yeah. without, now you know throwing throwing away too many constraints if you iterated on it then it then it's got a little bit of polish and there you go it's super ready to be a business card or little you know flourish product thing uh, if you think about each page as being about five minutes worth of work like again thinking not about like drawing excellent and thinking not about really formalizing your thoughts on it but diving in and doing writing on the page right um if you think about five minutes a piece, you got 40 minutes. And we, I have done this with students where we, we finish the eight page mini in 40 minutes. Cause like sometimes I'll, t I'll set a timer, but like five minutes uh, and then like, okay, time's up, move on to the next page, you know? And they'll be like, but I'm not done. I'm like, you'll have bonus time at the end to go back and fill in your ideas. But the idea is to keep moving, you know? Yeah. And I, I play it by ear when I do that in my classroom. For those who are like thinking about like running this in their own classroom. Cause if you have an especially anxious room, I've just poisoned the water. <laughs> so I'm like three minutes left. I'm like, ah, ah, ah. And I'm like, okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> this is supposed to be fun. <laughs> yeah. Right. So <laughs> there is a, in that, in that facilitation role, obviously there's a temperature in the room. And if, yeah. Yeah, if you just caused everyone's heart rate to go through the roof, it's like, well, maybe not. Yeah. Yeah. There's, they, well, you there's, can back it down. You can know. Yeah. You, yeah. You could back it down. And, and like, yeah, there's two kinds of heart rates. Cause there's like the ones where the kids like start screaming at me, like, like, like on a roller coaster and like, they're having fun with this pressure. Right. So I'll say two minutes left, like, ah, you know, but it's joyful. But then there's the ones where I see their bodies lock up. I'm like, okay, okay, okay. Guess what? Well, let's take the let's take the time limit off and just like do it the best we can with the time we got, you know. But that'd be a perfect thing. Like, do you carry like dice with you, like an as an affectation? Just go. Oh, bonus minutes! <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is a great idea! Oh my gosh! And like, not even tell them what I'm looking for. The dice just roll them just, just to perform yeah. the motion of it. Yes, yes. Oh, Rob, that is so good. That is such a good way to hack the game and make it like less pressure for them. Um, oh man, while still maintaining the forward momentum of the time limit. Love it. Mm. Oh, you um, want to take a break? Oh, I go ahead. do. I do. One little thing I wanted to mention that I uh, thought I didn't fully complete that it's a quick one though. Having little weird artifacts that can, that are part of the story of a bigger project. That's, mm. that's really like, this can be this little thing in the background of a, of a bigger, like, oh yeah, I wrote an ebook on this thing. Oh yeah. This is the mini comic version. It all came it was, you know, I tested the idea here or whatever. Oh, it's my business card. It, and all of a sudden, you know, there's, uh, those neat little artifacts are, uh, they can just sort of fall out of bigger projects too. And, and they don't have to do the same job as the big thing. No. And I've been, I've been meaning for a long time to do a little version like this of one of my talking animal stories that I like to do just as a way to make my business card even less expensive because like this would be like eight cents a unit to make right mm -hmm. versus 
25 to 30 cents a unit for my screen printed or letterpress mini comics. So, um, mm-hmm. yeah, I be, it's, it's been on my list of things to do for a long time. Um, but yeah, um, if, if going back to my idea of like, you know, this could be your, if, if you're a cartoonist, this could be your best business card in the whole world. Um, and Ryan Estrada talked about this in the show. It's been a while since we've mentioned our Obi-Wan Kenobi ghost. Um, he actually t- made business cards that had a comic on them, which I think is equally awesome. It demonstrates his, what he can do. So, mm-hmm. All right, let's take a break, and then we'll talk about fiction mini comics and the little structuring exercise I came up with for that. Um, but before we do that, we got to thank some people who make this show possible, and those people are the folks who support us on Patreon. Yes, patreon.com slash lean into art is the website. What is it? It's a way for you to give us a monthly upvote. If you say, I believe in Jersey and Robin, what they do, I want to help make their show more sustainable. But how do I help? Well, you can contribute as little as a dollar a month. You could also make a one-time donation and cancel at the end of the month. Uh, you can cancel at any time. But we have some people who have been, you know, supporting us on a regular basis. And we want to thank five of them right now. Thank you to Mike White. Thanks so much for believing in us and what we do, Mike. And Dave Sri Say who you can find on Twitter at Dave Say, the creator of the Emergent Task Planner, which has been a part of my life since 2012. Thank you, Dave, for the support and for the ETP. And Nate Marcel. Nate Marcel, another cartoonist and teaching artist you can find on Twitter at Great Sea Monster. Thanks, Nate. And Spencer Hallam. Thank you so much for your support, Spencer. It means a lot to us. And finally, Gail Bushman. And you can find them all at leanintoart.com or at patreon.com slash leanintoart, where you will find every show we make as well as the extra leans, the shows we record only for people who support us on Patreon. And those posts not only are like, you know, 20 minutes of me and Rob finding a topic on the spot, which is always fun to do and listen to, uh, but those posts become an open mic thread where you can talk about whatever you want with fellow leaners in a safe space. Patreon.com slash lean into art. Thank you to everybody who supports us there. It means a lot to us. It really does. It's that's awesome. And, you know, we, we put together a little, uh, extra things from now and then things like uh well when you sign up you get them you get some comics from us also there's uh our discord and that has special channels for the leaners only uh there's a couple of public channels but then in by all means everyone come on join us there there's there'll be a link to join our discord discord in this uh in the show notes but of course um yeah some extra channels that you know nice place to socialize and also do some uh, do, do a little bit of, uh, you know, collaborative, constructive work, get some feedback on the things you make. If you want intense feedback, there's castle level up. If you want the gentle feedback, there's gentle town and you just get some, you know, cheering on, of, of you know, getting you through your process. It's a nice place. Yeah. yeah I like it. All right. You know what time it is? It's that time. <laughs> it's in my it never gets old. In your ear. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so yeah, so much then for nonfiction mini comics. What if I want to make something up? What if I want to do what my buddy Greg Shigo calls a make em up? Um, but I don't know where to start or how to build it, or I just I just need something to give me a little bit of a nudge to push me and give me some forward momentum. And so, um, this is a workshop that I developed based on literally based on the way I make mini comics, the way I think about it, like especially eight page mini comics, eight pages. I like that a lot because one, this size, you, you can make a whole comic on one sheet of paper. Um, if you want to do a more traditional or traditional, um, what most people think of when they think of mini comics, which is like four and four and a quarter inches wide by five and a half inches tall, a quarter of a letter size sheet of paper. Um, you can do the whole story on one sheet of paper printed double sided. So again, there's like there's an efficiency of replication that comes out of the eight page structure. And also I think the eight page structure or the eight page um, limitation lends itself to a certain kind of structure that I use as an initial scaffolding for writing all of my eight page mini comics. And I mean, you can look at any of the the mini comics I've made in the past, they usually follow this format, at least in some way or another, like very loosely. Um, and the workshop version I do is called mini comics odds and evens. So we literally draw, um, we write and draw the odd pages first, and then we do the even pages and we'll walk through it step by step. And, the, and there's a reason why there's a reason why I do it. Um, because, um, 
if you think about a story, there's a lot of ways to think about approaching story. I'm not going to be prescriptive and say like, this is the way you write a story. But a, a lot of times, if you ask somebody what story is, they'll be like, well, it's the stuff that happens. It's the stuff that the, the events that happen in your story, the plot, right? Okay. So let's think of the odd pages as being our plot pages. And let's think of the even pages as being our sort of character narrative pages. And by chunking it out, once again, we're chunking it out. So you don't have to think about, we don't have to think about how the characters necessarily feel right now. All we got to think about is what the characters are doing. Let's just figure out what the characters are doing. Where are they and what are they doing? So let's go through the pages uh, step by step. Um, oh, I guess like the initial setup um, before you start. Um, when I do this in a classroom, what I will I encourage the students to start with a blank slate. Don't walk in with any pre-designed story where you have all this epic backstory they got to dig through. Um, all these character relationships and charts that you've made, as, as awesome as it is that you've done that, for this exercise, the whole idea is, once again, getting you engaged in the creative process in a fun way. So we're going to take 15 minutes, set the timer, 15 minutes, and you're just going to sketch some ideas on a blank sheet of paper. Like, just sketch some character ideas. Start doodling some characters. What is, and like and I encourage them to like just mix things you like together. What I like football players, and I like uh, giraffes. Okay, giraffe football players, let's draw some. You know, um, Start with as... as as simple as that kind of word association and that kind of like collecting of um, uh, premises, characters, ideas that you like. Boulder and Fleet, the web comic and graphic novel that I wrote, literally began with me sitting down at my desk with a blank sheet of paper saying, what are things that Anne likes? I was like, let me, I'm going to make an eight page mini comic from scratch and I'm just going to make it as if Anne is my client and she has given me uh, a pot of money and says, just make something that will delight me. Okay. Well, I know she likes bears, so I wrote down bear. I started drawing bears, and then I drew like a whole bunch of bears together, and I was like, eh, I don't know, this is getting a little bit Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles-ish with four bear brothers. Let's not do that. Well, what else? What other animals does she Oh, she loves birds. Okay, that's a bear to bird. Literally, that's what I did. I was like, bear to bird, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> and it was that fast. It was that like rushed and improvisational. And, um, you know, if you look at the first Boulder and Fleet mini comic, it's not what the comic became right it's it's got differences it's it's a testing of a hypothesis so like we're really encouraging this idea of like you just come up with a hypothesis like what's a thing that you think might be a fun story right um okay. sentient garbage can who doesn't want to eat garbage anymore wants to eat health food boom let's go the chud with a dream right i i started with that title we've talked about this video comic a bunch of times on the show it was like what what is a chud with a dream? Chud is a cannibalistic humanoid underground dweller from that like eighties uh, camp movie, um, not camping movie, but a campy movie. Um, yeah, campy so, horror. Um, yeah. A very intriguing artifact to walk by in the video store. That thing on the shelf. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Like, wait, what is that? And I I always put it back on the shelf. I never <laughs> went to the, It's like. I don't know. <laughs> Cannibalistic human underground dweller. Yeah, sewers are funny. I don't know. <laughs> and boop, back on the shelf. <laughs> yeah. But the mini comic Chud with a dream. That's, phew, I love that. But seriously. <laughs> I'm like, this, I yeah, love that. Yeah. It, yeah, it so comes up on the show. It does. Well, because it, it was, it, that is a good example of me being playful with the format and just engaging with it in a way that is, you know, experimental and joyful and not being too precious about it. Right. Um, and starting with a silly idea, Chud with a dream. What does that even look like? Um, okay. So, but, them, but taking yeah. it seriously though, and you created a narrative, like you follow the principles of like, you, you made us like, that's what's so funny. Like there's a very inviting what uh, in the beginning. And then you, you, you go on a, a, a brief narrative that where the, the Chud, uh, <laughs> Let's see. Face face uh, self doubt in the working world, and then ends up finding a place. Right? And yeah. You put that off in a mini comic, anyway. And there's even a dark night of the soul point where he's like, his parents are trying to talk him out of pursuing these endeavors. Like, you're just a chud after all. Come on, home son. <laughs> They're talking to him from in the sewer hole. That's right. Up. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it, it, it happens in an eight-page mini comic, and and this is where I have to give credit to Matt Fizell, uh, Detroit-based uh, comics mini comics legend, because I I 
got this sort of approach or this approach for me was informed by his mini comics workshop where he really breaks it down into like what are what's the structure of story let's map it onto some pages and now all you have to think about on each of these pages is that particular moment don't think about what comes before or after you'll get to that just focus on what's happening in front of you right now it's like comics mindfulness um so so we do this uh again we're going to draw the odd pages first and not do our best to not worry about what's coming before, middle, or after. Just focus on each individual page. So, page one. What's page one? This is your setup, the opening scene. You know, where do you begin your story? Uh, are your characters meeting for the first time? Have they known each other for a long time? You know, where were they? Uh, you know, like before this this story began, and how does it lead to this moment? Mickey Mouse and SpongeBob are meeting at the beach. Why? You know, what what are they doing at the beach? What kind of beach is it? Right. So just focus on that initial moment of establishing. The, the who and the where. Um, then I, then you move, jump page two, go to page three, and now you're going to get to your conflict. Something happens that either, you know, we've examined conflict in a variety of writing classes, right? It's like something's either preventing your characters from getting where they want to go, or your characters are arguing amongst themselves, or some kind of outside event happens that makes things terrible for your characters, like, oh, we're at the beach, and a tidal wave suddenly shows up, you know? Or we're at the beach, and they can't d decide on what ice cream flavor they want to get, you know? And they're being, they're being like uh, people on social media saying, well, you can't like chocolate chip mint. Only monsters like chocolate chip mint. And like, well, my dad was a chocolate chip mint guy. Guy, and I'm gonna be a chocolate chip mint guy, you know. Um, <laughs> whatever they're arguing about something, and all you're worried about when you're drawing page three, just figure out what the conflict is. How are you gonna solve the conflict? Don't worry about that yet. You're gonna get to that, mm. you know. Um, so then, I like, yeah, I like some of your prompts here for the questions. Like, so a conflict yeah. can be just through through not knowing what you need to do. Is it a puzzle to solve? And you know, does it get does it get physical? Is it is it you know where where is the pro? There's a problem, right? And right, it needs to be faced. Yeah, yeah. You know, what I could really go for is some ice cream. Well, where do we find ice cream here? You know, now we've got that's a problem too. Not being able to find the thing. All or... beaches, no ice cream. <laughs> so then we jump page four, go to page five. Well, now a twist happens. You know, the story was headed in one direction, but now it quickly changes gears. Uh, you know, what we thought was true is no longer true. Um, th does the twist raise the stakes, or is it a twist that might be a positive twist, right? Um, you know, like, oh, we can't find any ice cream, and all of a sudden an ice cream truck jumps the meridian <laughs> and crashes into the beach, you know, uh, <laughs> nearly killing our heroes. Something, something that changes what kind of story it is in some way or another. And the, and the twist doesn't have to be like a huge, like, you know, no, that's not true. That's impossible twist. It could be um, a minor twist, right? But just something changes. And then you jump page six to go to page seven. And this is the conclusion of your story. Um, you're solving whatever the conflict was um, or failing to solve the conflict. Um, you know, did, did, did it turn out that like, oh, we thought this was going to be like some great thing where everybody gets medals at the end but maybe it's like it's like a tr sad trombone at the end um but in any case like whatever the general conflict was it's no longer a conflict for good or bad right um and it's not yeah so do you and do you do these pages in this this order so so i happened i pulled up i pulled up uh one of my mini comics to demonstrate just to prove that i'm not a sophist, but I'm actually like talking about what I do. I don't know if you can see my screen, Rob. Um, I'm, I'm streaming it on Twitch, mm -hmm. but um, so I've got Baron von Bear, uh, the mini comic I did uh, two years ago, and here's page one, which is establishing the setup. We've got a cuckoo clock with a weird little cuckoo uh, creature inside of it. We got Baron von Bear and his wisps, and we got him at the restaurant where the story is going to take place. We have this uh, sort of Mater D, uh, in, you know, talking to Baron von Bear like they have some history, and he's even introducing there's a band in the the um, restaurant. So we're establishing all of our principal characters for the most part, and we're establishing, like, you know, the general sense of setting. Let's skip page two, go to page three. 
page three, the band starts repeating itself over and over again, and they de they de detect something is wrong. There's a puzzle. Why is the band just playing the same little piece over and over again? It feels funny, and the Baron sends one of his wisps to investigate, right? So there's conflict. And then we go to page five, twist. The cuckoo clock is haunted, and they think they're going to have to fight the cuckoo clock, but instead the cuckoo clock grabs what we thought was the antagonist, and they, be, they merge into a single bad guy, right? So now instead of having to fight a, a haunted cuckoo clock, a cuckoo clock or a comical sorcerer, they have to fight both of them as they have joined forces, right? Mm. And five, then we skip page six, go to page seven, you know... Baron von Barry uses the orange wisp to like knock the the bad guy down and then use his staff to enact the curse removal spell. So the resolution of the con of, of the uh, story of the, of the conflict, the conflict is no longer conflict because he is, you know, using his uh, magic to win the day. I mean, we don't get to see the result until page eight, but we'll get to that. So you see what I'm saying? The structure is there, and that, and that uh, so, right, I've, we're, we're, hey, Jersey, you don't like rules, do you? No, I, <laughs> I, it's, uh, I, I, I really was pretty sure that, that um, the, the format, it functions, and, and, and I know you've, you've used that. I was curious, is, is, do you ever write page seven first, or page five first, or do you go yeah. one, three, five, seven? No, no, I, I jump around all the time. So, like, in the case of the Baron von, this particular Baron von Bear book, the part where the cuckoo clock sucks in, um, uh, oh my gosh, uh, uh, Count Fishraven's head is like one of the first drawings I did in, in planning out the story. I'm like, oh, I want to do a really creepy scene where there's this big, dopey, comical fish wizard, you know, who's full of dignity. And, you know, it's, it's always a good joke when you have somebody who thinks they're very dignified and then, like, their pants fall down kind of thing, you know? And so, like, I, but but can you do it in a way where it's also kind of Twilight Zone, Rod Serling eeriness, too, right? And, like, let's take these two... I wouldn't even wish that on a fish wizard. <laughs> right? So, like, it's like I think of um, which episode was It's a Good Life, the one where the kid keeps wishing people into the cornfields, and there's that part where the kid turns his uncle into a jack-in-the-box and Boy, is that scene, even in the original 1950s uh, or 60s Twilight Zone, it's so creepy because it's the mix of something horrendous and something comical. And so I was like trying to go in that direction, and, I, and that was the image. And so I sketched out this image of his head getting shrunk inside of this cuckoo clock. And, you know, so like ideas happen you know writing is kind of like like tapping into the same parts of your brain that like creates dreams and like it doesn't necessarily happen in any kind of linear order so i i don't recommend that anybody think of this as being like well you have to do page one before you do page five now if you got the conflict or the resolution figured out first do that and then go back and reverse engineer because it's still using that same method you've divided up the the storytelling into sort of separate jobs that the pages have and mm -hmm. it's just doing the jobs in a different order and and uh yeah i was curious so yeah good question cause, yeah, because I can see going into it, like having a picture of a particular part of like uh, maybe page one, but then, yeah, but having the twist or, 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 you know, sometimes starting with the end of like, oh, I can see that this is when it all happens, like at the, that big moment. The main idea for me is just to compartmentalize the realms of concern. So I'm not thinking, if I'm working on page five, I'm not thinking about page one and I'm not thinking about page seven. All I'm focused on right now is like, what's the twist? How do I work out a twist? What does it look like? And then resolution. What's the resolution look like? You know, I figured out all the other stuff or maybe I haven't, but let's just figure out what the resolution is based on like a vague idea of what the, the conflict might be. Um, because then the resolution can inform the conflict. I have written stories where I figured out the ending first and then sort of worked my way back to what the conflict even is because the ending is something that, it's just like a neat idea for a character to grow in a certain way. So um, anyway, yeah, very good question. So now let's turn to um, the even pages. So you got your odd pages. Now you figured out your plot. You know, you have your conflict, you have a twist, you have some resolution. So what, what what's left? We got these even pages, two, four, six, and eight. So page two, well, I'll go back to my Baron von Baer thing um, and pull that up on the the screen well let me let's walk through them first and then i'll pull them up on the screen so page two is characters interact you put them in a place you've established the the who and the where well now how do they feel about one another so um 
what can your character say that leads into the conflict? You know, um, you're bridging these two moments too. Like on page three, some kind of conflict happens. Is there something that instigates the conflict? Um, is there something that can like hint at or foreshadow the conflict? Um, and this is also an opportunity for you to play with this idea that you hopefully didn't feel too beholden to on pages on the odd pages, but get your characters to say one line that expresses their inner life. So how can you get your character to say, I'll have bacon and eggs, please, in a way that only they can say it. Like we don't talk in a way that is purely factual and, um, you know, subject and predicate. We have ways of expressing our ideas in an idiosyncratic way. We use language in our own ways. How can you get them to say it in a way that tells the reader whether they're a snob or whether they're nervous or whether they're angry, whether they're grumpy, whether they're joyful, right? So page two is about that. So then we turn to page four. Now the characters react. Four and six are both reaction pages. Four is the characters react to the conflict that tells us something about their inner lives and motivation. So now that the conflict's happening, how do the characters feel about this conflict as it continues, right? And then on page six, the characters react to the twist. Now the twist happens, how do they feel about that? And how can we get them to express their inner lives through their reaction to the changed circumstances? And then finally, page eight is a how and why question. How or why question needs to be answered. How is the world different as the result of this adventure? World meaning the relationships between the characters or it could also mean the environment itself. Or why is it the same? Why is it? Why is the reset button hit? And why did the conflict not really change anything? Um, there's something about the characters. There's something about the world that that necessitates that. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. This is. Uh, it's like the uh, the emotional landing, right? There's. Uh, uh yeah taken it's i guess it, it wouldn't a lot of the 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 meaning and point of the of what you just told happen right here yeah yeah and and i i just tried to simplify the question down to just think of a how or a why how is it different or why is it not um, it sounds like a the, really useful approachable way to, to to tackle it right because again so the the page has this general job of well concluding the story and it's like everyone you know you've uh, tracing plot arcs and stuff it's like well I, a lot of us can can get that but then really specifically you don't have to uh you don't have to have five goodbyes at the end of lord of the rings or what have you um <laughs> on your eighth page um right <laughs> you could just well how is the world different or why is is it and that's i yeah so yeah. that's really handy. It's like drilling right into um, a way to, to accomplish that job. So going back to the Baron von Baer mini comic. Um, so here's page one, which is the setup. And then page two is characters react. So now it's just all I got to do right here is just get the characters to talk to each other a little bit um, and show how they feel about things. And here we introduce another character in the form of Count Fishraven, whom we see that he is a competitor with Baron von Baer and that the Wisps don't have a lot of respect for him. He starts to cast a spell, and the wisps say, oh dear, he means to use verse magic on us, and they all start laughing at him. So we can tell that he's not a very well-respected competitor, but the Baron's treating him with, you know, uh, politeness. So we learn that the Count Fishraven thinks he's, he's too big for his britches, and the Baron is very polite, but the wisps are less than polite. Um, so there's characters interact then we go to conflict when we find out that the cuckoo clock is or rather that the the band is playing the same piece over and over again so something feels funny and then we get to characters react to the fact that um the conflict has been created by way of the cuckoo clock which is messing with time how do they react well the baron leaps to try to stop it he's like come back blue it's too dangerous you know, don't don't interact with this thing. We'll try to find a counter spell. But Count Fish Raven is like, but I'm going to capture the clock. I'm going to use it for my own, you know, purposes. So characters react to the conflict. Uh, twist happens. Count Fish Raven gets sucked into the clock. And then we have characters react to the new situation. And so the characters are, you know, um, trying to come up with ways to like so for instance green the wisp is like i'm going to help him i'm going to fortify him in body and mind by giving him health magic to keep the the baron from getting or count fish raven from getting sucked into the clock 
Violet is the capricious and tricky wisp, so she's going to zigzag around Count Fish Raven to distract him while the Baron comes up with the final plan to use the orange wisp for strength magic to then get to a resolution where Count Fish Raven is stopped. And then how is the world different or why is it the same? Well, it's different in that they stop the clock and save the little spirit inside of it, and the Baron even chastises him and says, you were one of untold numbers tricked into that seat, a pity that you all chose to trade places rather than to ask for help. Now we get to the aboutness of the story. You know, um, it's not wrong, or it's, it's actually a very good idea to ask for help rather than try to um, manipulate people to uh, trade places with you in suffering. And then... You know, a few closing panels to talk about, you know, setting up for another adventure when he's headed home with the cursed object. Definitely, a, like, this is a, this is that kind of um, the middle ground mini comic where you have a full, um, sort of a full comic experience to convey in eight pages. Mm -hmm. And I know you have constraints that that helped drive you through doing less uh, less process, but still, um, this is a very polished comic. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, yes, and it was meant to be. I would say like fifty percent of my polish level. It was meant to be like relatively. Um, it's well, like Goku, You're like, well, I was only using fifty percent of my power <laughs> level. Look, I'm not trying okay. to be. I'm not trying to be like like cheeky about this. I'm, I'm like, if you look at like Amazon Academy, the web comic I do with Dan Mishkin, mm -hmm. like this isn't even coming close to the level of polish and shine that I pull off in that comic. Those pages take like between eight and fifteen hours a piece to draw. These Baron von Bear pages maybe took three. Right, because I was I was inking off of the of the thumbnails, um, so the thumbnails were about thirty minutes a piece, and then like I chunked them into roughly three pieces for for Inktober. Um, so I was inking one panel a day, an hour at a time, or like one third of the page an hour at a time. So about three to three and a half hours per page. Um, so you know, so I'm pointing out the relativity of like so mm -hmm. so for you this was an this was this was constrained. It is um, um, definitely a a less expensive product to create, not not as much uh, mm -hmm. investment in time and energy. And yet, let's see. Um, well, right, I guess, yeah, this is, it's, it's, it's a pretty awesome little comic. Um, and I don't know, I guess I'm pointing that out. It's almost like, um, you know, everyone's mileage may vary. Uh, and yet this, let's see, this super pretty darn polished comic is using the same method. Like just literally there's no extra pages. It's eight pages and mm -hmm. it's the same, the same approach that, or the same flow. It's, it's a, in a way it's, it's like, uh, it reminds me of music in, you know, where, where it's like, Oh, verse, chorus, verse, chorus. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a, uh, it's music with a bit of narrative. It's, there's some rising tension and then, then um, a, co a conclusion that, that you have some kind of emotional outcome as a result mm -hmm. of the experience it reminds me it's 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 there is a pattern in here here that that you totally embraced and i don't know so at the same time i know that dep it depends on what uh, what anyone else would invest in that sort of um in in that endeavor right so i know i would take me longer than three hours to to come close to that. well I, I mean yeah and and i ran into some like really serious constraints in that like going back to earlier in the story um let me pull up the comic again when i get to the conflict on page three i had to show that the band was playing the same notes at least three times which means you got to show the band doing the thing and them reacting to the thing three times that's six panels well, I already had the situation where I had to also set up the, the fact that the band was starting to play. Count Fish Raven was walking away from his little interaction with them on page two. So well, how many panels are on this page? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen panels on this page on a mini comic, right? Which is like wasn't uh it wasn't ideal, but it was like what I had to do in order to establish that, yeah, there's like there's a time loop happening here. Um 
Right. And you showed, well, and you established it, well, because you're, you're, you're powered by those principles and mm -hmm. you want to tell the narrative clearly and you are, you know, you have the, the circumstance happening that, that can be seen, but then as, as a reader, but then also the reader needs to see the characters experiencing this and reacting. And that's, that's a huge thing. Again, I'm still working on <laughs> the reaction moments are a big deal, but you kind of, so you, you created a, an interesting challenge for yourself with this page in, in particular, mm -hmm. yeah. um, in, in, you know, yes, you have your, your certain style and aesthetic and the characters, the design, all these other consistent consistencies and, and uh, nice polish that you've, you've got into this, but then all of a sudden you've got mm, a lot of moments, one page. <laughs> yeah. And there you go. Like this is, I mean, you pull it off. So, but yeah, but the main idea was just to demonstrate that like, this is a principle that I loosely follow myself. And I'm not just saying this to say like, well, here's a formula that always works. Well, it's not a formula that always works. It's a, it's a suggestion. It's a series of prompts to help motivate you to organize your thinking so that it's not being lost in the weeds. Um, I, I, this, and this topic was actually inspired by, I just listened to the audiobook of, uh, save the cat, which was, Oh, I got to look up the author's name. Um, it's on my phone actually because I was listening to it in using the Hoopla app from my library. Um, oh goodness, not that one. But real quick, just to make sure that I give attribution where attribution is due, and I will link to it in the show notes. Um, well, where are you? By Blake Snyder, Save the Cat. It's a screenwriting. It's a how to how to write a screenplay book. But I thought like, yeah, it'll probably be of you know, used to me as a cartoonist. And he really follows like a similar, he has his own formula that he follows where it's like these certain story beats happen by this page of the script. And <clears throat> I'm not going to make any comments about like how, you know, how much he enforces his own rules as, as, a, as an author. Um, but what I do think is interesting is that idea of giving yourself a rough um, scaffolding to start hanging ideas on. And then, you know, then yes, then break rules, right? Um, see, it, see if you can put the conflict on page four and have the twist happen on page six and see how you can wrap it up in different ways. I mean, that's the fun of it. The fun of it is, is I mean, any game that you play is like, it's like trying to... Um, find the most fun to way fun way to play within the parameters that you've set you know yeah i mean you're trying in in the in those terms you're trying to um create interesting choices so yeah. that the the act of choosing is engaging and you can feel uh, a sense of a, co a competence and accomplishment and yeah. if you if you navigate a, a process and you're you it's this is um, I don't know if you do you ever get this situation where you think um, let's throw out throw out the rules or does or at least some voice in your head say you know stop it with the rules um, because mm. I, I feel like I, I do that sometimes and uh, when do you do it I, I well um, well let's let's take um, art sound off <laughs> <laughs> for example, um, I once I, if I I didn't have like a really set in stone commitment in the beginning, other than I really want to do all thirty days. And gosh, I really like these prompts we just did. Oh, I have all these other things to say. I don't know. Let's just go. And so, uh, sort of jumping into the process before having a, 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 enough of like a foundation laid, I think is where I can get into trouble with, with sort of, especially casual projects. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then throw piling on other stuff saying, well, it's gotta be of this quality. And I never, it's like, I, it, it's like, I'm my own, uh, I am in my own head, my a very unethical salesperson <laughs> where like, you look like you can afford this project. Come on, check it out. This is <laughs> You yeah. know, in yeah. your skill range and uh, time budget and all that stuff, no biggie. 
We we, we both have the same unethical salesperson. I was having this discussion with a friend recently, and they were saying, don't you have a voice in your head that says, no, 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 that like to keep you out of trouble? It's like, no, actually, my problem's kind of the opposite. My problem's like, how hard can it be? That sounds like a good challenge. Let's go. And then I'm like, oh, no, oh, no. And... <laughs> And like a lot of times I'm so grateful to be married to such a conscientious woman because like she'll be like, she'll put her hand on my back and be like, are you sure? And I'll be like, uh, oh, you only do that when you want to keep me from jumping into quicksand. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I, ha- I I do have a problem with that. Um, but the throwing out the rules, yeah, I, I do do that occasionally. But um, unfortunately, I'm in a position where so... I get to experiment with my work so infrequently that it usually happens at A2CAF where like if I participate in incubate uh, sessions, like what was it? One year, two years ago, we did the 1212 experiment where we had random objects and random headlines and we had to put a story together. And I remember doing a, um, one of these size, the, you know, the zine style mini comic. And it was about like a, a young girl who has like a, a horse in a horse race. She's like the owner of this like racing horse. And then like I tried to introduce like this weird like sort of twist ending where she's only doing it to get revenge on somebody or something. I forget how it ended, but it ended in a way where it's like, I really don't think I had any juice in this. It was me being experimental and failing. And I didn't like what I, I didn't really care for what I had. Um, but that was me saying like, okay, rules, forget it. Let's just riff. Let's riff on paper and see what happens. Um, and it was actually, it was like, it was really fun to, to, to work that way. Um, and uh, the thing that I always enjoy about throwing out those rules and doing that is that I feel like, um, it's the closest I get back to beginner's mind when I'm doing this stuff, you know, like the point when I feel like I'm really lost, but lost in a super safe way. And that's what I mean by like, when I'm talking about beginner's mind, I'm saying like, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know what's going to happen, but the stakes are really low. You know, I, this is a place where I can fail and it doesn't have any, you know, lasting repercussions on my psyche or my opinion of myself as an artist. Um, hmm. I think that, so I think what you're describing is that you, you successfully adopt the rules up, up front and seem to be fine with that once you, once you've done it. And I think I, I'm inconsistent with that. And so mm. I, I'm, I really do find both of these exercises very appealing and trying to do them in like, as they, um, uh, you know, as, as they are, instead of saying like, well, oh, I can do 12 pages. I could do, you know, cause I, I, negotiate out of a lot of these things to, I, I think yeah. sometimes, yeah, it's still learning. I still, I've, I've created, you know, some mini comics and, uh, but like, even like the two pizza team mini comic, I think could have been, uh, tighter if I had mm. adopted, uh, this approach. Yeah. Something I think you and I have had a lot of discussions with in the past about your comics in the past is that remembering to think what, how does each character feel about what just happened and, and what, how can I show that in an efficient way? Right. Mm -hmm. How can I show like what, what their emotional reaction is to the thing? Um, which is that's yeah. And that's part of the point is, uh, it's, I don't know, it's easy to sort of negotiate out of the rules and then not necessarily, um, you know, get the, get the benefit of the exercise. So that's, that's where I'm, I'm just trying to extra describe ways that I see the potential in these exercises and they're mm-hmm. worth doing just, just as they are. There's plenty of room to experiment and explore. They're not that prescriptive. It's, mm-hmm. it's a, it's a fairly bare bones, but very functional, uh, foundation that you you've set out here and uh, no thanks uh yeah i mean this is this is based on years of experience working with young people who i've watched them so many times and guilty of this myself you know i was a young person once and i was a beginner once and you know it's like you you can easily blind yourself to what is necessary in the moment by thinking about all the stuff that needs to come before and after and all the production values and all the like the try to introduce cleverness like throw all that away don't worry about cleverness. Don't worry about production values. Don't worry about what comes before or after. Just worry about this particular moment. What is the conflict? And that sounds so, it almost sounds glib and dismissive. It sounds like, well, they're arguing over whether a number two pencil is better than, you know, an HB or a B pencil. Well, that's not really a conflict. Well, it can be. 
it, if it, depending on who's doing the talking, you know, my wife and I have had like, like really serious heated arguments about black, uh, Palomino black wing pencils. And I, and I go like, they're okay. And she's like, no, they're great. And I'm like, yeah, they're really okay. Like, well, why do you think you think that your Pentel pencil so much better? You know? So it's, yeah, it's well, real, let's see, real moments explored with, you know, attempt, uh, you know, attempting to tell that story with, with the clarity and whatnot. I mean, that's, that's the, uh, yeah. yeah, that's great. Doing that is a, like, I mean, it's, yeah, it's a very useful endeavor. So I don't know. That's I, cool. I not that the point of this was to sell me on it. I already, already was sold. It's just like, they're like, it's like we're getting into, into, into like maybe what could be um, some final thought exploration. Too. Great. Okay. So, yeah, let's do final thought in a minute. But before we do that, we got to thank some other people who make this show possible. And those people happen to be us. We make the show possible. And the thing that I make that I hope you will check out is uh, Boulder and Fleet Adventures for Hire. This is a comic that began as an experimental mini comic. This is me being playful with the idea of saying like, hey, my wife would like to read a book about a bear and a bird who go on adventures together with other talking animal characters. And in playing with the idea over the years, I generated a 92-page uh, graphic novel, which you can get at books.jdrosed.com. Um, be a great holiday gift, everybody, for the young person in your life. Uh, Bear and a bird go on adventures together, and the bird is very ambitious and wants to um, be the most famous of all adventurers. And usually adventuring means like beating up villains, but she's partnered with this very powerful bear who would rather make friends than uh, conquer enemies. And so there's a built-in dynamic between the two where one is pushing, the other one's pulling, and they wind up getting embroiled in these battles. In this particular story, Mining for Trouble, they wind up fighting these uh, young rock creatures, these young girls who are rock creatures who eat precious metals, and they have taken over a mine to steal all the precious metals and eat them, and some conflict resolution happens both in fleet style, uh, which is much more punchy-punchy, and boulder style, which is much more talky-talky. So you can read it uh, at, at boulderandfleet.com, and you can purchase the book at books.jdrosed.com. Rob, I'm very excited about the new thing that you made. Oh, thanks, Jersey. Um, yeah, this this is uh, this is uh, if you follow any of the stuff I do, I talk about my goal planning process sometimes. I talk about journaling sometimes and how they they kind of interact and and all that stuff. And and we've like we've explored this a lot, Jersey, on Lean Into Art. I've explored it a lot on my podcast with Kate Shield Stenzinger, the Art and Science Punks. Uh, this where uh, in our house we really do a lot of. Um, it, for us, it's as this sort of, especially a yearly cyclical thing of, of doing goal planning and looking ahead and, and looking back and and like we've got, we've had a lot of activities we've tried and I mean it's only it, it, time flies because it's been about almost twenty years since we've been doing this stuff, uh, even longer as far as uh, the where I've I've been doing this stuff since my my teens but um, okay so so what well we've tried a lot of different goal goal planning and journaling methods and. Uh, we've we've honed and put together something that's that's like a couple of products. We've got the Where Next journal, and there's a free version of it actually too. So you don't even have don't even have to um, buy anything from us for to to check it out. The journal has activities that facilitate some creative thinking. Color in the lines, color outside the lines. Use the rules, chuck the rules, just react to them, right? So, but they're um, bite sized exercises to start thinking through um, and just sort of framing aspects of, um, of goal planning, like thinking about your life in five years and there's different interesting questions to explore there. Thinking about the um, uh, like living a day without fear. What's that look like? And things like um, you know, coming up with a word or phrase that summarize the, your, your sort of future vision, that kind of stuff. All, all sorts of the the free version has six exercises of the for for the journal alone. That's a downloadable, printable PDF. And then there's there's an expanded version that has warm ups and guide guidance all baked into the journal. And that's like thirty pages, um, but still very bite sized. You could tackle each of, each of these activities in just you know minutes, but you could take weeks if you wanted. Sometimes we do that too. We'll sit with one one of these things, think about it, do some journaling, come back to it. And guess what? The whole story of all this and actual facilitation, us, us walking you through and sharing examples, we've got that captured as a video workshop as well. So it's the Where Next Journal is the little 
workbook, right? And then we've got goal setting using design plus storytelling. And that's where it's a video workshop series. It's like um, nine videos that add up to 28 minutes where Kate and I walk you through the whole process. And that's available both on Gumroad and on Skillshare. So if you're already a Skillshare member, check it out. It's like Netflix. It's another thing available to you. So then uh, do, do, do. That's, that's what I have. And I, I suppose we'll put a few different links in the show notes to make it easy to, uh, to find that stuff. And you just search for Rob on Skillshare and you'll find this as well as the other workshops that he makes. Um, yeah, goal setting using design and storytelling. Six empowering design activities. Given the time of year that we're in, this seems like a very timely um, I hope so. Workshop I series. think, I, yeah, that's the intent is not to say, guess what? Feel pressure, you know, make the goals, <laughs> get more ambitious. You know, I'm anxious. You should be too. It's the, the it doesn't <laughs> have to be that, that kind of thing. Like each of these activities, it's, it's, um, it's meant to be helpful, supportive, creative, and, uh, and do a little bit analytical too, to make it, um, uh, uh, a lot like these exercises like that you shared Jersey, like mm -hmm. you're facilitating a creative experience and um, you get a product in the end of it. And I feel that that's a pretty useful, nourishing, helpful thing. Goals and the, all the process, how you manage them and stuff. It, it's, we have a lot of, I think we have a lot of different big feelings and relationships with it where um, because I think it gets like, we talked a bit about this too, where it's, it's like, who's, who's telling you what goals, like, where are you committed and what are your roles and all that stuff. And this is really saying, maybe that all exists. You have maybe your professional thing. This is just going inside your own experience and mm -hmm. exploring you, that for you as an individual. Um, yeah. And all I was just suggesting is this is probably top of mind for a lot of people. And I was just underlining I, that, like, that yes, you're probably thinking about this right now as we enter or head head toward a new year. So, you know, if if you're thinking hard about it and you need some some kind of guidance and prompting like we've been exploring in this episode, goal setting using design and storytelling. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, we've we've used a lot of these these methods and uh, and and have benefited learning from lots of others out there. And uh, it's neat when you encounter a journal or an exercise, but maybe like it would have like, we would have liked to have had someone sharing a little more of their thoughts about it and a little more examples. And that's, so we did that. We kind of put the product out there. It's like a lot of us where we were, you feel the, the thing that you wish existed and, you know, yeah. Together. So that's what we did. So, and we'll link to it in the show notes. And the other thing we'll link to in the show notes is the Lean Into Art Discord. Yes, there is a forum now for the leaners. And there is there are three public channels where you can po do topic requests, comment on past episodes, and then also post any challenges or quests that you're currently on creatively. And then there's three channels for folks who support us on Patreon. There's the Castle Level Up, where you can post things that you're working on where you really want to get some input from the Brain Trust is to like help you make this thing even better if you're striving and you want to strive even harder. And there's Gentle Town, where it's okay to ask for a high five. Look at the thing I made. I feel like it looks like a thing. And everybody's like, yes, it does. High five. And finally, a social channel where you can post like, just stuff that's happening in your life. And the invite link will be in the show notes for this episode for the Lean Into Art Discord. Now, final thought. Final thought. Hmm. Well, I think we were, we were wandering toward the the um maybe the the tricks and traps where things you know have gone could could go awry and uh, i i i sometimes live life as an example for others to not do um uh, to not follow and it, that's that's where that's where i was going where with uh with I really see the value, but I, I, but yeah, I'm a quirky human being and I still sometimes don't do things that I think are, seem like they'd be very useful. <laughs> and, uh, that's, that's along that line of thinking, is there sort of a way to, um, how, how do you encourage, or is it so ingrained, right? So how, how, how uh, would you I gotcha. encourage yeah. someone who maybe has that tendency to say, well, it, this is, this is why you'd want to just give it a try eight pages. 
first of all, I would I would encourage by saying, dude, I have been there and I get it because like the first time I played D and D, um, I came to it. It, so I was with a very prescriptive dungeon master who was like, I have my monstrous compendium and I don't deviate from it. These are the rules and this is what we do. And to which my reaction was like, even at the age of the ripe old age of 14 was like, we'll see about that. <laughs> <laughs> the world hasn't seen this yet. You know, I got creativity that's going to blow the doors off of this place. Watch me go, you know. So I showed up with my own idea for a character before I even rolled the stats. And they were like, and I'm like, hey, this is the guy I want to use. And this is what he does. And this is what his powers are. And this is what his weapons and abilities are. And they're like, and the dungeon master was like, no, 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 that's not how you do it. That's not how you do it. You do it by rolling dice. And then you base the character on the stats. And I'm like, nope, nope, I'm coming and I'm doing it this way. And to their credit, they actually let me go along with that. They let me like sort of like, I gave them like a description of the powers. And I'm like, well, that sounds like that he would have an 11 stamina or whatever, you know? And like, so we like sort of made up the stats based on that because I was really pushing my point. And then the next time, like, and I played it and it was pretty fun, but um, the next time I was like, all right, well, let's see what this whole thing is about, like, rolling the stats first, then building the character out of it. And I built this character that, like, I got to feel that thrill of surprise and delight of watching my creativity happen sort of outside of myself, if that makes sense. This moment where I let the world interact with me in a way that when I was done, I was like, oh, I made a character, you know? I didn't it didn't feel like I was making a character, but I made a character in, in doing this. Um, and suddenly I realized that there was more to creativity than, well, I don't wanna say it that way. There's a kind of delight that comes out of surrendering yourself to um, letting the outside world interact with your creativity. And when I, when I say that, what I mean is, is by surrendering yourself to the rules. You're saying, okay, rules, you're a co-equal partner in the creation of this thing. And I'm going to trust that these rules are going to guide me to something. And now I, I sort of get to watch as a third-party observer as it's happening as well. Um, and so by, by pushing against those rules in the past, I was depriving myself of a unique experience in the creative process that that and here's the good news i don't have to do that ever again I, I i had the experience and i'm like wow cool i watched a character sort of form in front of me and it's my character i just based it on these these constraints of these these dice rolls um and i mean i still actually carry that um the the, the little sheet my character sheet from that character in my wallet like since i was in high school his name was kamado the president he was the president of a foreign nation and he was kicked out because he was corrupt and so he became he was like well i was really good at bamboozling my government so i'm going to become a thief so like it started out with like i you know character class thief well what do i do with that well here's the backstory i'll come up with right um and, but he still calls himself mr president <laughs> so Anyway, yeah, so I went through the experience and it was delightful. And then I, I feel like I, I, I connected more with like what Dungeons and Dragons is all about. But then I went back to making my own comics. So it's like I wasn't trapped by it. It wasn't like, well, now you, there's the only way you can create, dummy. You're stuck. No, it's just it's you. There's part of what makes the creative process fascinating and interesting to me is the novelty of different ways of trying it and different formats and different approaches and different constraints to play on yourself so that you can... Um, this goes back to something we said in a past Lean Into Art episode is like, we only get to experience something for the first time once. And a lot of times, at least for me, nostalgia is all about wanting to experience that again. And good news, the cre creative endeavors provide you with an opportunity to experience something for the first time a lot of times. <laughs> so if, if surrendering to the rules brings you closer to another new kind of experience. Wow, you just did a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. I'm glad. <laughs> because I didn't know. <laughs> I didn't know if I was going to get there. And it feels it feels good when you actually like make the landing a little bit. <laughs> yeah, that's a heck of a landing. That's Oh, good. Fantastic. Um, thank you for that. Yeah. Well, thank you for playing along and like giving me some really really good uh uh counterpoints and questioning on this. Um I feel like I, I understand my own topic a little bit more thoroughly now. So, okay. Uh, 
we record the show every Thursday uh, at noon Eastern time, uh, 11 a.m. Central. We stream it live on twitch.tv slash Lena to Art and then collect it as a podcast at patreon.com slash Lena to Art and Lena to Art.com. Please subscribe and review wherever you listen to the show. That helps the show out a lot. Until next time, everybody, I have been Jersey Drozd of Lena to Art.com and Jersey Drozd on Instagram. Yeah, and I've been Rob Stenzinger of leanintoart.com. And I'm also Rob Stenzinger, places like Instagram. Okay, bye. Show notes for this episode can be found at leanintoart.com. You can also follow us on Twitter at the user leanintoart. And you can reach us via email at leanintoart at gmail.com. And remember, leaners aren't wieners. Thanks for listening.